The story of the UK is an economy that has got real momentum. What is broken can be repaired. What is ruined can be rebuilt. UK inflation is becoming much more homegrown. We have huge potential as an economy in the UK. This is a time to tell Israel there is a path to peace. Our plan for the British economy is working, but the work is not done. You're listening to Bloomberg UK Politics. I'm Stephen Carroll. And I'm Lizzie Burden. Now, Stephen, I'm still recovering from the fact that we've had three prime ministers still. in two years. Yeah. I'm not surprised. PTSD over here. But there is some who are in the Conservative Party who think there's still time to squeeze in another one before the general election. Here's what the Business and Trade Secretary, Kemi Badenoch, had to say about these rumours that rebel Tory MPs want her to take over Rishi Sunak's job. A lot of people who are going around doing this are creating uh, problems and difficulties that the party and more importantly the country does not need. I fully support the Prime Minister and I have said many times that I stood uh, uh, to be leader and lost and the last time we had a contest after Liz Truss resigned I said that the right person to lead the country was Rishi Sunak and I still believe that to be the case. They need to stop messing around and get behind the leader. The fact of the matter is most people in the country are not interested in all of this Westminster tittle-tattle. And quite frankly, the people who keep putting my name in there are not my friends. They don't care about me. They, they don't care about my family or what this would entail. They're just stirring. And we have 350 MPs. This is a small number of people who are doing this. The vast majority of Conservative MPs support the Prime Minister, as we saw in the response to uh, the article that Simon Clark put out last week and I think that should be the end of the matter. So a full-throated rejection of the rumours there from Kemi Badenoch. But in fact, if you look at the latest league table on the Conservative Home website, she is the most popular among Tory members to overthrow Rishi Sunak. And our Bloomberg opinion columnist Martin Ivans, who's also former editor of the Sunday Times of London, I should say, writes that she's the woman best placed to replace Rishi Sunak. She says that few rising stars have been quite so open about their thirst for the crown. And she has had this rapid meteoric in fact rise to the top of that Conhome league table since her election to parliament in 2017 and actually he says she's more centrist and pragmatic than you might think she's got lots of friends in the moderate and centrist Tory one nation faction and he points to the example of how she watered down the hardline Brexit EU law bill which would have automatically repealed all EU laws by the end of 2023 unless it was actively retained and how that's actually had quite a positive impact for the UK economy. But in any case, what's saving Rishi Sunak is it seems no one wants to take the crown before the election because it'd be like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. If yeah, the I mean, well, right. yeah, indeed. And while, while Kemi Badenoch is uh, perhaps talking uh, about how no, she couldn't possibly, couldn't possibly be interested <laughs> in that and no, that wouldn't terribly happen. Rishi Sunak is instead uh, focusing on vapes, it seems. The UK government planning to ban disposable vapes as this is part of their ongoing attempt to try and reduce um, children using e-cigarettes. This was, you know, another uh, mention of a policy that was out at Conservative Party conference as well, one of those things of pointing to a health measure or something. Uh, perhaps the PM trying to score a good news story win, perhaps reassert a little bit of his damaged authority after the, the rather fizzling rebellion last week from Simon Clark, the former minister. Liz Truss has been out to say that she thinks the, the ban on vapes is profound unconservative. So very interesting to see how this plays out within the ranks of the Conservative Party. But while the Conservatives are in disarray, businesses are looking at what the opposition party might be offering them. Labour is using this week to launch their big pitch to the corporate world. It's an area that they want to use to prove their economic credentials. Look no further than Mark Carney, the former Bank of England's endorsement, being given pride of place at the Labour Party conference last year. Rachel Reeves is a serious economist. She began her career at the Bank of England, so she understands the big picture. But crucially, she also understands the economics of work, of place, and of family. It's beyond time to put her ideas and energy into action. 
Mark Carney, of course, also the chair of Bloomberg Inc., which is the parent company of Bloomberg News as well. But his featuring in that moment at the party conference as well, being considered one of that step of the endorsement of the business community of the Labour Party, the party pulling off a similar stunt today with former Conservative donor and chairman of Iceland, Richard Walker, now saying that he backs Keir Starmer to run the country. Our UK business reporter, Sabah Maddings, is with us to talk about this further. Sabah, great to have you with us. Why is this ex-Tory donor and business voice changing his affiliation to Labour. Ex-Tory donor and let's not forget he also ran well tried to get on the list for a Tory seat um, Mm. last year so an interesting um, Mm. he now says he's had a radical change of heart Um, he says that Labour under Keir Starmer has moved moved towards the centre ground um, in which he's always stood whereas at the same time the Conservatives are moving away from it Um, he also highlights I guess a kind of a common grumbling a lot among business um, leaders is the, the kind of the merry-go-round of ministers it feels um, like he says that there has been 13 housing ministers in the past eight years um, and so obviously a lot of uncertainty there so yeah he's um, he's thrown his weight behind behind the pine labour so we know that Rachel Reeves has been on her smoked salmon and scrambled eggs offensive I think another CEO said that everyone who wears a tie in London has been to breakfast with her does it mean that this is the first of many endorsements by CEOs I think Labour would certainly like that. They've clearly got a, a big campaign trying to get more people on board. We had, um, you know, and that, that extends to breakfast. They were out at Davos last week meeting tons of business people, both from the UK and internationally. They had a breakfast um, hosted by JP Morgan. Um, I mean, then he's not the first name. We have had got Gareth Quarry, um, a former Tony, Tory donor that then um, switched to Labour. Um, Justin King, the former Sainsbury's boss, said Labour has a credible business story while the Conservatives were taking business for granted. Um, but yeah, I mean, Richard's come out today. I certainly think Labour would love for uh, many others to join him, um, join them, sorry. So um, yeah, and I think probably more from that in the coming weeks. I wonder in your conversations with business leaders as well, are they that bothered about who, who, which politicians they're meeting and are they excited to hear from them? Because we haven't got a great idea about what exactly they're going to do for business or for the economy. That's a common complaint we've heard over the past few months as well. Will you speak to business people? Are they excited to meet Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer? I think um, excited may be a strong word. They definitely, <laughs> they definitely want to find out what they, what they, um, what they're standing for. So I guess that's part of it. They want to hear from Reeves. They want to kind of glean some idea about um, what a, a business under Labour could look like um they're certainly you know they're concerned about whether there might be some um changes to taxes whether that would be a sort of a bank levy or um a surcharge on profits from the financial services sector there's also you know labor did call for a windfall tax on the energy sector after the war in ukraine drove up profits um we did speak to jonathan reynolds labor's um business shadow business secretary last week last week in Davos and he did dismiss the prospect of using the uh, windfall tax instrument more widely he said they're not a good policy in the sense they bring an uncertainty and they um so you know they're probably only in a special um circumstance and he also said you know we've got to talk stop talking about financial services just in terms of how much tax they contribute so there has been um some kind of meat on the bones from from that perspective but certainly as we go into the rest of the week and a, and a key part of all these meetings the business has been having is trying to get some idea about what they might get. Yeah, you have to wonder, for me it comes back to whether business actually just wants to cosy up to the party that looks like they're going to be the next government according to the polls or whether they're endorsing them because of anything they've actually said. Also, it seems uh, therefore like it would be quite inconvenient to Rachel Reeves that the former Labour leader, Neil Kinnock, in an interview over the weekend said a wealth tax could be imposed to boost public services. He was talking about assets above £10 million, £12 million worth examining, in his words. When you talk to business leaders, how worried are they about potential tax rises? Um, I mean, I think it's that point, you know, there is that that worry on, um, you know, any kind of levy. Um, I guess one interesting thing to say is that Pascal Sorio, the boss of AstraZeneca, actually made an investment decision outside the UK because of a tax rise last corporation tax last year and he he made an investment in Dublin so it's not as though they're not already grumbling about tax rises I guess I'm I'm trying to say and and so I think that seems to be the kind of uh, slightly less something people raise less they're more they're more focused on getting some kind of certainty 
OK, Sabah Meddings, our business reporter, thanks so much for joining us as we look ahead to those announcements from the Labour Party. More on that in the programme throughout the week too. We'll be monitoring out to see uh, what announcements come around from that. Now on to something we debate often here at Bloomberg, the state of the UK housing market. We spoke to Zoopla's Executive Director Richard Donnell earlier, who told us some rather shocking news about the size of the house deposits required in London. The conversation started there with a discussion about what's been happening to the market in the capital. Take a listen. Um, it's largely wages going up um, ever since really 2016, London hit sort of peak unaffordability incredibly strong growth in house prices, 20% year on year in 2014. And ever since that Brexit vote um, impacting employment growth in the city, (laughs) then the pandemic, now higher rates, London property prices have gone largely sideways. They're only up 13% in nominal terms in, in seven years and wages have gone up. So we've seen a sort of slow improvement in affordability, uh, but as you highlighted, you know, London is is getting more affordable, but it's far from affordable in the context of, of the UK. Exactly. So I have to wonder whether this surge in buyer interest in the capital is actually going to translate into sales. Is it going to be a seller's market? No, I mean, we're still stuck firmly in a buyer's market, both in London and across the UK. Um, you know, in London, the South East, our data shows that nearly one in four sellers is having to accept 10% off the asking price or more to achieve a sale. So, I think, you know, um, home buyers have been encouraged by reports of falling mortgage rates. Um, that's bringing people back into the market. But I, I don't see any prospect of house prices suddenly taking off. And there's probably been a bit of over exuberance in some of the reporting around this. But um, the good news is people want to move. Um, but again, I, I wouldn't write on, on any house price inflation uh, this year. How is supply at the moment in the market in London? Because you've seen sales agreed up 13% at the start of the year. So an uptick in activity, but but what sort of levels are we talking about? Um, well, we've certainly seen an increase in supply of homes for sale. Um, they're, they're back to normal levels in London and both the national level. So that shows there's people who want to move. Um, there could be some investors in there looking to sell. But supply is up. That's boosting choice for would-be buyers. Um, that's still driving this sort of uh, negotiation uh, in price between sellers and buyers. Uh, and again, we, we, th- we see I mean, our, our core forecast was that housing transactions across the UK will be the same as last year at one million. Um, you know, if we see this level of activity, then there could be some upside to that. But it's, it's not going to be significant. You know, we're still set for a year in 2024 of, of slightly below average numbers of transactions. Just anecdotally, Richard, it seems like you can't get a look in in the London property market unless you're a cash buyer. Is that something that is set to continue? Well, I think um, your cash buyers accounted for about one in three sales across the whole market last year. Um, That's larger because mortgage transactions fell away. I mean, you can if you're, you know, but I think the challenge is is getting a mortgage in the first place. Um, you know, with uh, some of these mortgage regulations that came in, you know, the average first time buyer in London's putting down £145,000 deposit. So I think you necessarily need cash from an equity position if you're using a mortgage, either from a, a property you already own or from or savings or friends and family. Um, but it still remains, you know, the mortgage market remains important. Um, and that's why it's so important that mortgage rates falling are going to bring more people back into the market. Richard, sorry, I just... If I was eating cornflakes, I would have just choked on them. £145,000 is the average. Is that unusual? I mean, oh, histori- well, in historical terms, I mean. It is unusual. It's, it's, it's gone up, and that's data from the Office for National Statistics on just what the average uh, median deposit for a first-time buyer was. I mean, look, first-time buyers have been getting richer, and they've been having to put down more money. And, and, and this is partly to do with mortgage regulations introduced in 2015. Um, you know, banks are only limited on how much lending they can do above four and a half times loan to income. Um, there's also, you know, today's buyers, even though they're paying four and a half percent mortgage rate, they've got to prove to their bank they can afford eight percent, nine percent. So the only way you can really make a mortgage work is by putting down ever more equity. So we've definitely seen buyers having to put more equity down, particularly in the London market where prices are higher. And this sort of affordability squeeze to buy your property is greatest. So that was the executive director of Zoopla speaking to us a little bit earlier on. So London homes have never been more affordable in this past decade, but they're still the most expensive relative to earnings in Britain. Hence, no wonder they remain a hot button political issue. Interesting too to note a Knight Frank poll over the weekend finding that 70% of house builders surveyed favour 
a Labour government. So how much politics is there in housing then? Joining us to delve into the issue is Bloomberg's corporate finance star, Neil Callan. And Neil, great to have you with us. Can I ask you a little bit about the, the housing market first? Because Zoopla, sounding very upbeat about more sales being agreed, supplies returning to the market. Have we avoided the the significant downturn that there had been these dire warnings of in the UK market? Yeah, I, I think it's still a case that we have to wait and see. A lot of the optimism at the moment is based on the fact that mortgage rates came down and the expectation that the Bank of England was going to cut rates a lot this year. Now, with what's happening in the Middle East, uh, with the Red Sea, with the Suez Canal, you're seeing more and more disruption potential to the inflation outlook, which would give the Bank of England pause about cutting rates. And that would again flow through to mortgage rates, which may cause buyers to pause again. So last week, you already saw and they're raising mortgage interest rates after all of the uh, the cuts we saw in December. So um, it's a very, very early day still in the housing market. The housing market takes a long time to make up its mind as to what it's doing. So we'll we'll wait and see, but I think it'll be the second half before you start getting more clarity. And then the other thing that's helped the housing market an awful lot is prices have fallen quite substantially in real terms. So post-inflation, housing prices are down 15% in the UK. And if you're getting wage rises of 8%, which is not unusual in the private sector, unusual in the public sector, but not in the private sector, then suddenly those homes look a lot more affordable. So as long as wage uh, rate increases stay robust, as long as employment stays robust, the housing market has a very good chance of getting through this. But affordability is still a huge problem, Neil. We had a kind of choke on your cornflakes moment this morning when Richard Donnell said that the average deposit to put down on your home was £145,000 in London. And when you've got both main political parties agreeing that growth needs to be a priority for the UK economy, which of course links to productivity, how much of a problem is it that Brits are putting so much of their money into housing? Yeah, the easy answer is yes, it really is. Um, Huge amount of money going into mortgage payments, particularly after the interest rate increases, and that affects the rest of the economy. If your mortgage is going up, you're going to be spending less in restaurants, you're going on less holiday, fewer holidays. You you know, you know, you might not make that investment into something that's tangible in the economy that otherwise you might have made. Uh, so it does have a knock-on effect in the economy, and high house prices are not a good thing in general for the economy, uh, and in fact can raise dangers as well. Of course, supply is very key to, to how pricing dynamics work and b- both political parties have set their targets as to what they want in terms of uh, house building as well. But that's not a quick solution. I mean, that experience being felt in, in many places where there are um, difficulties uh, in, in housing supply, is there realistically a path the government can set that will actually help su- fix the supply end of the bargain? Yeah, I think what people want and on the developers and on the buyer side is certainty and to have a coordinated policy response that's going to remain in place. And one of the problems that the industry has faced is the turnover in housing ministers, for example. There's been 16 housing ministers since 2010, which is an incredible statistic. The government also ditched housing targets. They've ditched planning targets. They've ditched leasehold reform. Uh, before that, under Boris Johnson, there was plans for planning reform forms, they also got dropped. So if you're a developer thinking about investing in a project and and like if you're, that can be, you know, often three years to 10 years if you're a Barclay, uh, one one of the big home builders in London, because Mm -hmm. they do more complicated projects. It's very hard to get that certainty to know that now is the time to do this. If you don't know whether six months time, the whole a political outlook may, may, may have changed. And um, apparently there was a poll over the weekend showing an increase in support among developers for the Labour Party to come in. And I suspect that that is what it's linked to. It's the idea of getting some certainty as to what is needed from the housing market, what's expected from developers and how they're going to deliver that. Well, this was a topic that we were talking about with Sabah earlier. What is it that's attracting house builders as part of business more generally, to Labour. What are they actually promising other than stability? And I think that's enough, because if you're 
investing millions and millions of pounds before you actually really big, begin construction. So you're investing in planning, you're investing in um, environmental studies, you're investing in the underlying infrastructure, uh, roads access, etc. That's before you actually any, build anything uh, and have to sell them. So you, you just want that stability. And there's been an awful lot of change in the last few years in housing and a lot of, an awful lot of proposals that then have gone nowhere and seem in, inevitably stuck. The government on infrastructure has dropped plans for things like HS2 and so forth. And so infrastructure and housing just doesn't seem to have been as big a priority for them in the last couple of years. So to be clear, is it not a reflection that house builders think that Labour's plans to build pl- houses on planning, for example, are actually better than what the Conservatives are offering? I, I mean, that's not for me to say, but one of the frustrations that developers have had is that Conservative MPs have lobbied heavily to prevent building of homes around towns and villages around England, less so in London. And that makes it difficult to provide housing. If you're not, if you're objecting to housing development, if you're ch- changing housing development plans, if you're tearing up rules that were brought in, then you're not going to get the housing. People from the area can't live in the area. People from the area get priced out by people moving in. And you have a whole series of impacts from lack of housing pr- provision. But the other side of that, of course, as well, is that part of the story of the past decade or so of housing in the UK have been various incentive schemes helped to buy stamp duty changes that have tried that have sort of juiced the housing market to an extent. How distorted has the market been by that? And and does that actually affect this idea of going forward, trying to look for stability to know that you won't be, for example, have a developer holding back in the hope that there's more juice, frankly, for want of a better metaphor, to come. Yeah, I mean, the latest plan that's been floated is the idea of 1% mortgages for buyers, which the Conservative Party may or may not announce in the coming weeks. Um, the, the theme of the last 10 years is we are going to boost demand, not boost supply. All of the government incentive schemes were based around increasing demand for housing, not supplying more housing. And if the political priority for whoever is in government next is housing supply, then they're going to have to look to address that. The financial crisis wiped out most of the small housing developers in the UK. Housing associations, which are the other big providers outside of the home builders, are going to go through a very, very tough time in the next couple of years. A lot of them have completely overpaid for land and are going to run into some difficulties uh, trying to service that debt and provide other housing as well. And so the home builders are the ones who are left to provide this housing. But for them, because they're publicly traded, the incentive is to sell them at the highest price. They're already cutting supply. That's absolutely normal. Their, their, their duty is to the shareholders. But the government doesn't seem to have an alternative plan for where the supply will come from. Yeah, it doesn't look like we're going to get a plan like that in the budget that's coming in spring. But is there any way of unwinding this boosted demand without pain for homeowners who, frankly, are voters? Yeah, I mean, again, that's a political decision that needs to be made by governments in that if housing supply is rapidly ramped up, then yes, there will be an impact. But a lot of the people who own these houses at this stage don't have mortgages anymore or have quite small mortgages. A, a huge percentage of homeowners don't have any mortgage at all. And so comparatively minor, if, that, if that's what, what was to happen, house price shifts don't affect them that much. What it does, is it, it, and it can have, is a significant impact on people who have bought in the last three years who face much higher mortgage rates. Uh, and that's the, the debate that they'll need to have is... Do we prioritise lower cost housing for people or do we prioritise the people who bought in the last three to five years? Neil, you, you alluded to it there and it's something that a lot of your work now focuses on are the financial difficulties facing some of these big developers and, and, and some of those development projects as well. Is there more of that to come and more of that to worry about if we're thinking about the perspectives for the home building in the coming years? Yeah, um, we went out to a housing project in a town called London, outside London, um, 
and you know that that's been basically abandoned for nearly two years uh, half completed the the housing association ran, ran into financial difficulties it's now been taken over by another housing association but that's not going to be uncommon housing associations will have troubles but it's in the interest of the wider group to take it over and not allow distress comes out because they borrow at very very low rates so if somebody was to run into trouble in default they'd all pay more so generally the industry comes in and helps out the smaller people who run into trouble but that in turn means that there's less money available to build new housing um, and they have to focus on some of their land banks which are built up during periods of low interest rates i.e. they paid an awful lot for land and land values tend to fall the most in a downturn or in a pause um, and you're seeing even at the high end you're starting to see uh, some elements of distress there was a, a project in Mayfair where the lender moved in last week uh, and there's going to be more of this going forward um, a lot of the distress debt in the UK is around construction and property development and people you know when you when you do property development you're, you're, you're it's all about hope value it's like what will this be worth when I'm finished so you're generally an optimist and, mm. and a lot of that optimism has come out of the market, um, particularly from low, higher interest rates and people are going to suffer as a result of that business people will. Well, I love that you've been actually out in the field seeing what's happening. You're like in the big the look short. look of those optimists, I think. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, it's like in the big short when they go and see the swimming pool full of crocodiles in Florida. That's you, Neil. If you find a swimming pool full of crocodiles, you'll come back and tell us about it, I hope. <laughs> That's <laughs> Neil Caladad, Bloomberg's Corporate Finance. Sir, thank you for being with us. That's it from us for today. If you like the programme, don't forget to subscribe. Give it five stars so other people can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you listen. This episode was produced by James Woolcock and our audio engineer was Max Green. I'm Lizzie Burden. And I'm Stephen Carroll. We'll be back with more tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg UK Politics. Listen weekdays at noon on DAB Digital Radio in London.